without further any further ado, help me welcome John. <coughs> and you can give him a round of applause. Okay, so uh, John was recommended to me by uh, my next door neighbor who's a, a, well, he goes to all kinds of things, private equity, venture capital, and so forth. And he's been saying, so he's doing a lot of work with John. And, uh, and then when I found out before I, uh, before I actually set up this interview that uh, turns like, turns out that everybody says John's a great guy. And those of you who know Tian Wong, uh, so I was really looking forward to coming today, but he's just flying back from Brazil, so he was not able to make it work out. So we're really lucky to have you, so I appreciate that. When we talked on the phone so a couple weeks yep. ago, right, one of the things I noticed is when I got your picture, because so when I got you, you look at his bio, he says he's been a CEO of Snow Valley for 30 years. And so I looked at his picture, I said, R really? 30 years? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how's that even possible? When did you start the business? And he did, you know, he, so why don't you talk a little bit about how, that, how it's possible that you ran a company for 30 years? Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, the key to, to longevity start is starting young and, and getting lucky, I guess, in, in some respects. And uh, it, it, Snow Valley was, it was and, and really still is my only true full-time job. Um, I started at the age of 21. And um, really coming into, uh, Snow Valley already existed, but, but was struggling and was, I think at that point, about, um, I think we did about $120,000 worth of business that entire year. Um, and uh, so I, I really came in just to clean the business up and, um, and, and get it going um, enough to be able to sell the business. And uh, several years later, I'm the one who bought it. Um, so that was, uh, that was my job from the age of uh, 21 until I was, um, until I was 49. Um, actually, the day before my 50th birthday was the uh, was the closing day of selling the business. And you had a, you I know you can't go into any details yet yeah. about the acquisition. Can you say who who acquired it? Uh, yeah, I, I sold the business to uh, Nestle, um, Nestle Bottled Waters of North America, um, and uh, they own some brands you you've probably seen Deer Park, Arrowhead, um, a, n a number of others, Poland Springs, um, Perrier. Um, they are the, they probably represent about 40% of the U.S. bottled water market. Okay. So, so when we talked on the phone, you said when you all started, um, you had some ideas even when you were really young. And you, and you started working at 21, and it yes. was around 23, 24, you just realized that you could run things a lot better than the company was already doing at that time. It, yeah, it, it's, um, so... So my, my family history is that we had a, a, a soft drink business as well. And when I first came in and, and started fixing up the business, I said, oh, well, you know, we already have a model of delivering and trucks and bottling. We should be able to do this. And it didn't take me long to figure out that it was really sort of two different businesses. And um, so, uh, you know, there were, uh, it, I guess at that point it seemed like most of the, most of the moves were common sense. And, and one of the great advantages of running a business at 21, if, you, if, if we all think back to when we were 21, we pretty much knew everything in the world. Um, so that helped a lot to know everything to be able to run the business. Um, uh, it, it, it is funny, I, I, I spend a little bit of time from time to time with Kevin Plank, who, who right. founded uh, Under Armour, and really at about the same age. Right. And, and in some ways, it was what we didn't know that led us to success as opposed to what we did know. Um, there was, you know, in both cases, there was an overriding belief in, in, um, in the fact that we were in the right business and in our ability to run those businesses, whether that was well-founded or not. Because he, he talks about it and he said, well, gosh, um, you know, if you really thought about competing against Nike and Adidas and Reebok, that's probably not where you want to Right. You know, go do it. But he didn't think of that at 21, and thank goodness he didn't. And and um, you know, I can I will say this: it, it, that in in 1980, the the uh, the competition in the bottled water world was much smaller than it is today. Um, this was a there was it was about a 200 million dollar market in the United States. About 120 million of that was in California. Wow. Um, so. 
you know, my, my biggest competitors outside of California at that time, um, or, or even if I looked at everybody on the East Coast, um, there was probably one company that at that point was about the size that I got my company to, and there was nobody bigger. So um, it, was, it was a lot different. So talk a little bit about the water business back then, because we talked about there were several, several evolutions that you went through, which we'll, we'll, we'll hit on how you figure out those out. But So starting off there you know, 25, 30 years ago, what was the business for you? What were you doing, and how did you... Uh, I'm just going to let you co riff okay. on here. How did you differentiate yourself in that marketplace? So, so it's interesting because I think one of the, one of the key things that 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 we did and that that I, I see a lot of businesses not necessarily do is really define who our competition was, and operate under those, you know, with that as our competition. And that changed in the bottled water market. In 19 in 1980, as I said, it, the market was very small. The penetration outside of California. Market penetration was about one in 30 people used bottled water, so not, not too common. So there were a couple of things we did. We looked and said, who is our competition? At that point, it was the tap, the water that came out of the tap. We were sort of competing to give people better quality water. Um, and the other thing was, where, where are our good markets? Because somebody's got to be drinking bottled water. So one of the things I started doing was identifying where the demographics were higher in our for our particular market. Now this is in a case where business is ahead of itself. As time went on, we got to 1984, Perrier introduces itself and all the bottled water companies did well. They started raising the awareness, um, sales were going up, and all of a sudden our competition became other bottled water companies. Um, but in some, case, in some cases, we weren't selling better water. We were selling convenience. Um, in, a, in a typical office building, they would put a water fountain on every other floor back in, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. So when your employees wanted to go get a drink of water, they had to go down the hall and down a set of steps, and it took them a long time. So by putting a bottled water cooler in your office, you were saving employee time, making everybody happy. So it became about selling that, and, that, and so our competition then was time. Or, or our advantage was, was time, that, that, um, as opposed to good quality water. Um, fast forward another 10 years, and we're starting to sell, sell a lot of single serve bottled water. Now, you know, today that's pretty commonplace. 1990, you wouldn't have seen it in the United States. Hard to believe that it's only that old. Um, but as that came in, our competition started becoming Coke and Pepsi. Um, so it shifted yet again, and keeping an eye on who our competition was and setting up the company to compete against those kinds of, of companies and, and those kinds of competitors helped us a lot along the way. And as I said, it changed um, dramatically. When I think about markets, so um, one of our early marketing um, employees was a bicycle racing team. Because even when the U.S. market was, had gotten to about 1 in 20, um, bottle, uh, bottled water consumption by cyclists was one in three. I remember those Snow Valley jerseys. Yes. That's right. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. So, um, so we went after the cycling market and that helped, that was a much more cost effective way of marketing our product. Once we captured that market, eventually we had to move on, but, but by then more and more people were drinking the water. So as a small company, it was easier to sell to markets that were receptive to our products. So let's go back a little bit to mm -hmm. the, uh, even, even when the bottled water came out, so in the, in the, in the 90s, that yeah. was still not, that never really became the largest part of your business, right? It was always yeah. the, the large jugs in, in the coolers in the office, right? right. Yes. And you talked about one of the ways you were really able to differentiate yourself uh, even even when, as that marketplace started becoming more and more competitive, why don't you talk yeah. a little bit about that? So, so that's a, a thing when you think you know when we're thinking strategically is um, what what are we, what kind of company are we? You know, it's easy to say bottled water. So you say, okay, so you differentiate yourself by having the best bottled water. But the fact is, everybody had good bottled water. Most most pretty much all our competitors were high quality. Um, you know, we used to always worry about that because there were stories about how we're not regulated like tap water, which wasn't the case, and 
we knew it was good. So, um, but really when we looked at it, because most of my business were the bottled water coolers and, and the big five gallon bottles. We were a home and office refreshment business more than we were a bottled water company, even though bottled water was our big product. So what did we need to do to be good in that market? We needed top flight customer service. We needed reliable delivery um, and a good customer experience from when people called to how they get their bill. And those were the things we focused on because product quality just sort of was a cost of, of entry to the market. And so talk about some of those things that you did for great customer experience. This is pretty interesting. Some of the things you did that, were, that seemed to be trivial to many people probably, but that helped you really stand out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I always start with the easiest one is, is, you know, sort of honor all your promises. And in the delivery business, it's show up on the day you're going to show up. Um, but we did, we looked at every phase of, of how customers interacted with our business. And in the bottled water business, you end up with a lot of small customers. I mean, tens of thousands of customers that are doing, you know, $400 a year with you. And so it's, you have to be able to provide a unique customer experience, but, um, but do it repetitively and right every time. So, so that was one of the things, um, uh, you know, we spent a lot of times about, uh, about what happens when customers call your customer service center, the call center. And, and it was, you know, I talk about the call center, everything is in one office. So um, I think my, my call center manager always sort of dreaded the fact that from my office I could hear all of her people. Um, and, and, um, but um, we spent a lot of time sort of coaching them as to what their job really was. And I, you know, we would, I would ask them and say, well, so what do you think? And they said, well, to solve the customer's problem or to you know, transfer information. I said, no, it's, it's make the customer feel cared for because cared for customers stay with you. Um, we did uh, a, a lot of other things to help that experience and be able to provide our customers with better experience. We went to actually handheld computers that would print out um, uh, the, the receipt on their belts in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. Now for a small company to do that seems like a lot but it upped our customer service levels significantly because customers didn't have to wait to get copies of invoices anymore. Um, and aside from the fact that I didn't have to spend time going through a closet full of invoices, and as I said, with tens of thousands of customers, you get a lot of them. So finding that customer's invoice was hard. So now we could just go on something, email it to the customer, they were happy, they paid us faster, life got, life got a lot simpler. But we spent most of our time focusing on improving that customer experience. Um, because really to increase the margins in a business, you can do um, one of two things. You can lower your costs or you can increase your value. And I knew I was competing against some pretty big guys with a lot of, a lot of wherewithal. So I spent my time trying to increase value. And, and that increased both my ability to charge a little more and longevity of customers. Um, because, it, it, you know, particularly in a business where, um, you know, you're only getting about four or $500 a month from a customer, um, you need to be able to keep them for a very long time in order for that to become a profitable um, way to do business. So, and we also talked about other, some, things, some other things you did. For mm -hmm. example, um, and I'm not going give it, to give it away, oh. you, you talk about, but something like the, like the Rudy Giuliani broken window thing, uh, how you, I'm not saying you stole Rudy Giuliani's idea, yep. but the idea about taking care of the little details in, in how your uh, people were dressed and yeah. the, the equipment and so forth. Talk a little bit about that. So, so you know, one of the things to do this is, is having, we needed a, a professional staff that was dedicated and because we're dealing with so many customers and trying to stay, you know, lean and mean so that we can do this profitably, everybody had to be singing off the same page. So we had a lot of you know, sort of small rules that, that translated into bigger things. Um, for example, not only were all our guys dressed in identical uniforms, which seems to, to make a lot of sense, but um, while they didn't wear ties, this button right here had to be buttoned on your uniform. Um, the, the truck doors that slide down on the side have this little sort of canvas pull on them. 
Well, when they were driving along, the rule was that had to be tucked in. It couldn't be hanging out, flapping in the wind. Um, that actually had a couple things. One, it made the truck look better. Secondly, um, if you've ever been, it worked on a truck like that, when it flaps like that, it also picks up all the mud in the yeah. road, and so when you go to grab it. Um, uh, you know, our trucks were washed on, on a very regular basis. And, um, you know, everything was meant to, to present image, a professional image, and that had the effect of our people behaving in a professional manner because they were part of a professional company. Right, and so you actually talked about that also in terms of your hiring processes. So we talked a little bit about how, how you brought people on board and you know, a lot of companies, including some of the ones we've had come talk here before, talked about some pretty elaborate processes. They, they've gone through assessments and so forth that worked very well for them to make sure they good good fit. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you did to make sure that someone was a good culture fit? Yeah, I, and, and more, than, more than even in the hiring process, the, the, the sort of belief that there was one culture and so there was sort of, as we put it, there were, there were Snow Valley people. Um, it, it was so important um, to the success of the business because everybody had to kind of be moving at the same speed and, and, and people who didn't tended to slow down everybody else. Um, so we spent, uh, you know, there were a number of things that, that we did uh, that we looked at in terms of, of um, you know, sort of commonality amongst the people that were successes in our business. And, in, and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. Uh, but one of the things that we always did is rather than try to ease people into the company, w we, we kind of gave them some pretty difficult days right off the bat. And we had a number of people who would say, oh, yeah, this isn't for me. And much better to find that out on, you know, in the first week than to find that out after you've invested three months of training somebody. Um, and that tended to serve us very well. We had um, a, 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 a lot of people who had put in a lot of years with us. And that makes life a lot easier when you're running a business, when you've got um, the base of your team has been with you for five or ten years at least. Um, you don't have to keep re-explaining everything to them. Um, they start understanding what the goals of the company are and, and, and actually improving that as opposed to just carrying it out. And um, I think having that, that, that base of people that had been there that long, and that became a, a, you know, a, a majority of our company. Um, in fact, the majority of the people who worked for me when I sold it had been with me over seven years. Um, so that's, that's more than half of them had been there that long. And uh, um, uh, over a fourth of them had been there over 15 years. You know, and for a company that, that really 30 years is the longest termed employee, um, that's pretty good. So, um, but most of that is due to making sure everybody is a cultural fit. So now a scoffer would say, you know, gosh, John, you just, you, know, you went through a, a lot of effort here in order to get this customer experience the right way. I mean, you know, anal attentive clothing, the, the trucks, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that everybody fits the culture and so forth, and the, 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 the handheld units. So many things that you did in terms of customer experience. I mean, did, did it really pay off? Was it really worthwhile? I mean, how, what, what, what's the, how can you demonstrate value from doing all that customer experience stuff? Well, uh, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the easy things is, and I, I think this is true with almost everybody's business is that we look at the cost of acquiring a customer and the lifetime value of a customer. And by providing this, this level of service, we significantly increased our lifetime value. And that became very evident when, when I sold the business, is that we kept talking about, oh, you know, 10-year models of the company, and I kept looking at them going, you're folding this into an existing company. It's not like you're going to leave my company standing alone for 10 years. I don't, I don't get this. I said, here's my customers, here how old, here's how long the average customer has been with me, and here's their selling price. Translate that into your costs, and, and here, here's the gross profits you can expect from each of these customers. Now the only question is, how much do I get to keep and how much are you going to keep? And really that helped present the case of why my company was worth more than, and, and inevitably, uh, without giving away details, got paid more um, than other similar-sized <laughs> companies selling during that time. Um, 
So, <laughs> so um, and that leads on to another uh, topic here about okay. uh, strategic thinking. So, um, so I assert that this is really is the thing that uh, allows a small company to differentiate itself very well from from others is spending a little time thinking strategically because most because actually it's, it winds up actually being a competitive advantage in many cases if companies don't spend any time actually thinking where, where they want to go why don't you talk a little bit about that because we'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw something at you from one of the things we talked about was um, the one of the ways that you adapted we talked about arrows as an example right mm -hmm. of a company that was just did this phenomenally yes. um, and and then you also brought FedEx and you could talk maybe we could talk a little bit about those but right. how, how your company stayed ahead of of trends we talked about the water coolers as you know at the big mm -hmm. box board so why don't you go ahead yeah. and start talking a little bit so about um, I, I would say you know as you're running a small mid-sized company it, it's tough just getting the doors open every day and wondering whether everybody's showing up and you know making sure that you know your customers are paying you and you got to do this but really to be successful in the long run you have to I think you have to think long run and be constantly aware of the fact that your market changes I, I, I kind of talked about differing competitors um, one of the competitors that we had you know not seen really coming down the road I, I mean we saw them but we didn't get to see them four or five years out um, were the big box stores um, and and it's kind of odd you go well how does a big box store you know compete with a with a company that does direct delivery and the fact is one of the parts of our equation was that we rented bottled water coolers and in the you know 80s and 90s I, I would buy one of these things for hundred and forty dollars and I would rent it to companies like yours for twelve or fourteen dollars a month and they would last for 15 years. Uh, you don't have to do all the math to figure out that's a really good return on assets. <laughs> well, in, in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, as Sam's Club and Costco and all these guys started growing, they started importing bottled water coolers from overseas and selling them for $100. Well, you can imagine when you're trying to rent something for $140 a year and somebody can buy it for a hundred um, that took out about a third of our our rental base um, which actually translated into about a sixth of our revenue so um, uh, or I'm sorry a little about an eighth of our revenue so it, it was a significant number and the fact is is that that was all that revenue went away and not very many costs went away and so we had to say okay we're losing this revenue now what do we there are only but so many costs we can cut out of this what else do we have and that's where we really began to look at sort of the whole office refreshment business and said okay our core competencies are we we have a great delivery fleet um, that's that's very reliable we have a large set of customers that that have been dealing with us for a number of years um, and we have a, a good billing and customer relationship uh, system set up. Uh, how can we leverage this? And we looked at other products. Coffee, snacks, um, actually soft drinks, um, and started selling those into our existing customers to bridge that problem of, of the revenue that, that, um, that we had lost due to the water coolers. And, um, and I will say this, the margins weren't quite as good as that as they were on, on, on the, the water coolers, but you can't, you know, th those were great margins that were gone. And there was not an easy way to get them back. And, and I've been looking at the bottled water business since I've been out of it, and nobody's figured out how to get them back yet. But a lot of people are figuring out this other, other revenue streams with core competencies and, and your existing customers. Um, and our customers were really happy because they used to have two vendors, now they had one. And they had one they could rely on. Um, one bill to pay, one delivery person, all those things came in um, to be handy. And you've seen other companies adapt to take advantage uh, or, or to deal with things that happen like that. FedEx is one of, one of the great examples. Is that if you think about overnight delivery of things uh, and, and documents and stuff, and then all of a sudden, fax machines are invented. And then email. 
I mean, who needs to have stuff overnighted documents if, if with email? So that's when they bought Kinkos and rolled that into their whole service so that now they don't have to carry those, doc, those you know, sales brochures on a plane. They send them to a Kinko's office and they're printed there and they can do it for less cost, but about the same margin. And customers are happy, everybody's happy. But it was a way to adapt and take advantage of changing technologies or to sell to their existing customers. It's going a little off topic what we talked about before, because yeah. um, then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about your leadership. But um, how did that come around? So how, how were you able to, looking back over that past period, how were you able to, to think that way? I mean, because a lot of business owners don't do that because they get stuck in, I've got to execute, got to execute, got to, got to execute, got to execute. Now, how were you able to do that? So, um, <coughs> you know, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that helped me a lot was being a, a, an active member of several networking organizations. So you're always talking about your business and hearing other things come back and you're hearing other people's issues and it helps you think of, of helps you think outside the box a little bit. And also, you know, I, I would, um, I relied on several people, several advisors quite a bit and, and kept my mind open. And, and it was interesting in, in, in thinking about um, attorneys and, and I, I gave a lecture the other day at, at Georgetown Law and I, it came to me as I was talking that at least 50%, and it's probably more like 80% of the conversations I had with my attorney were about business issues. They weren't about legal issues. So who can you depend on to keep bouncing ideas off of? Um, because I always said, I, I was glad I had uh, you know, these organizations, and, and the, the bottled water industry had a very close-knit um, trade association. Uh, mainly because there were a lot of people like me, sort of small, mid-sized people that were regional, and so we weren't competing against one another so we could share everything. Well, if you make all the mistakes yourself that you could possibly make in business, you're never going to survive. So I got to learn from other people's mistakes. They got to learn from mine. So collectively, we could make all the mistakes without having to pay for them all ourselves. Right. And I think that was, you know, being parts of, of different um, you know, networking organizations was, was a big help in keeping that view going forward. But a lot of it's just the discipline to get your head out of the weeds and look at what's coming down the road. And you just have to say to yourself, I got to do this. I always had a plan for where I wanted to go. And, and some of it were, some of it was just, you know, when I first started, I mean, I was, I was sweeping the floors and bottling the water and having to go out on a truck. And so my goal was to get my company big enough that I didn't have to bottle the water myself anymore. And then, then my goal was to get big enough that I didn't have to go out on a truck. And it took me a couple of years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. But those were goals for out in the future that I always set to say, here's where I want to get to. And, and if, you know, if you don't have a destination in mind, it, it's hard to kind of navigate which road you're going to pick. So, <coughs> yeah. yeah. About the product, um, you said earlier today that pretty much you know all bottled water products are viewed the same. But it seems to me that there, there are two different ones. You've got filtered water and spring water. Um, how do you how do you market the differences, and and what were you guys? So, so I'll tell you a quick story. To, uh, we were spring water, and and I'll give you a quick story to tell you what I mean about product quality all being about the same, is that I was having a discussion with a, with a buddy of mine who has a, a company up in um, Connecticut called Crystal Rock, and uh, um, he had filtered water. And we were talking about the fact that he puts a lot of advertising into, the, into his filtration process and how great it makes his water. Yet he was guessing that at least 25% of his customers thought he sold spring water. And I was saying that at least 25% of my customers don't believe my water comes from a spring. Now, that's 25% of the people who buy from me. We happen to be having this conversation in the earshot of the marketing, uh, the, 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 the CEO of, of, Nes of uh, Avion USA. Mm -hmm. And he said that their research showed that 50% of all their customers 
didn't believe their water came from France. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we spent all this time worrying about all this stuff, and it, 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 in the eyes of the consumer, it didn't really matter. It just didn't matter. Um, you know, it mattered to some people. Uh, look, I, I, I spent my life in, also, as I said, my family is in the soft drink business. So I was a third generation Pepsi guy. So to me, there's a huge <laughs> difference. But the fact is, is that most people can't tell the difference, even people who think they can, can't tell the difference. And when the Pepsi challenge came out, and, and I was still a kid, my father sat us down at the dinner table and said, none of you are allowed to take the Pepsi challenge. Because <laughs> he was worried we'd get it wrong. <laughs> so. Well, so um, I'm going to read a little stat here that you gave me uh, when we talked, and then we'll go into uh, okay. uh, leadership. But uh, from your focus on quality, and the uh, you said quality is the entire customer experience. Yes. Basically, that's what it really boiled down to. Um, you commanded a strong average selling price to provide no value with good margins, and you were not planning on being the market leader. That was not your plan. Uh, and in you, all this focus on quality gave you 22 years in a row of growth, mm -hmm. um, well over half of which were in double digits. Yes. And your heyday was 1988 to 2002 uh, in, that, in that home and office market. Yep. <clears throat> okay, and oh, and just for its worth, home and office, single serve drink was not really your market. It was really no, I mean, day. we did some, in the early days when it first started to come about, we did it because the margins were good and, and uh, you know, my soft drink contacts allowed me to sell a, a good bit. But once Pepsi had its own brand and, and other people were pushing harder and margins started falling quickly. I mean, to give you an idea, we could, even back then, it cost us, uh, to produce a case cost us about four bucks. And we could wholesale that for about nine dollars a case. Well, now you, you, you know, any of us can go to Sam's Club yeah, and buy it for four dollars for, for four dollars <laughs> or three and a half dollars. And you got to be able to produce it for a dollar, a dollar and a half is really about where it, so, so the margins just shrunk to next to nothing. Um, so I, I just believed in, I didn't like the idea of high volume, low margin business. That's just, you know, some people thrive on that and do very well on it. That was not our forte. Ours was, you know, concentrate on a high margin value customers that, um, you know, appreciated what it was that we were really good at. Uh, because being a low-cost guy isn't something I could have been um, the best at, but in terms of providing quality service, yes, we could be the best at that. All right, so uh, just a few more minutes to, before I open up for Q&A. Uh, the, um, we talked a little bit about leadership when we talked on the phone, and um, I asked you about what was one of your biggest mistakes, and mm -hmm. you said it was, and this is actually interesting because this as I mentioned to you when we talked on the phone, I've, I've heard people say this was the best thing they've done, and I've heard people say this is the worst thing they've done. So just mm -hmm. to show you, it ain't easy, right? It was easy, everyone would do it. Right. But your biggest mistake was that you hired a general manager. Yes. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about that. So um, 2002 or 2003, somewhere right in that um, uh, point of time, I guess it was 2002, I hired a uh, general manager. Somebody I'd known, a lot of experience in the industry with a company that had grown very fast. Um, I knew um, the owner of that company very well. He had sold his company, so this guy was no longer working for him. Um, you know, just spoke very highly about him. And I looked and thought what I don't do well, because it's very important as a business owner to know what you don't do well so you can hire somebody who will do that. You don't have to develop the skill yourself, just hire somebody who does that. Well, this guy was a great planner and great on processes. And, and that was probably not my forte. I was more about understanding the experience and the quality and, and looking out into the future. And um, so it, at that same time, I'd started angel investing, was in a company called Infonic that was growing very fast. I was spending a good bit of time there, which, which was not a bad use of my time. But what I didn't realize is what, and what I didn't spend enough time with this guy explaining or making sure that he was following through is that he didn't quite get the culture and the whole idea of all those little things like the like the handles on the doors tucked in or the button done or what it meant to run customer quality or be a snow valley team member 
And he didn't quite get that. And it wasn't like he was far off or that he wasn't a quality guy. But that was the problem. And it, it, it hurt us significantly. Um, the other thing that I noticed is that, is that he, he, while I needed a, a lot more structure around the planning process, um, he was probably significantly too far. I was too far to the side of sort of ready, shoot, aim. Mm -hmm. And, and, but he was aiming forever. <laughs> and so somewhere we needed to get somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And, and so the mix just wasn't right. And I lived with it for a long time. And, and it, was, it was an expensive mistake. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I say it's an expensive mistake. At the end of the day, I, I, I did OK. And so you never know what things would have been like if, if, if you hadn't done it. But, uh, when you look at it, I, I, if I had spent more time making sure he understood the culture and following through and making sure that stayed, um, I think we could have done a lot better. Right, so applying the same kind of wisdom that you use for hiring your other employees, mm -hmm. if you applied that same, that same set of rules for your CEO, for your general manager, it may yeah. have operated a little differently. You may, right. ne may never have come on board in the first place. He may never have, or I think he would have understood um, I think he might have understood it had I spent the time. I don't, I, I, you know, I, it, at the end of the day, the buck stops here, so I tend to think of the blame is, is with me and that, mm -hmm. that I could have done a, a, a better job. It wasn't that he was a bad person. I mean, he had, it's just, he didn't quite get that little difference. It wasn't that he wi wasn't willing to, um, but when we, when we hire somebody and, the, and so they have, you know, and a supervisor and then they have me and they have all these people pushing on them, Whereas this guy was fairly close to the top, and, and I was no longer there every single day. Mm -hmm. and, and had I been there every day, it probably would have made a little bit of difference. All right, so how about we just open up for Q&A, and then what I'll do is at the end, I'll just have you uh, get some closing thoughts that you okay. want to make sure you pass out to everybody. So questions, John. How long did you keep the GM after you realized it wasn't quite working? OK, so when I convinced myself that it really wasn't working, um, not very long, but it took me five years to convince myself of that. Because you know we had been in a little recession. We had the big box stores selling water coolers. There were all sorts of things that were just that I could say, OK, this is why business isn't good. And, and, and uh, you know, I was um, helping uh, with this, uh, helping found this company in Phonic. You know, we were going from nothing to 400 million in three years, so you know I, I think my focus was a little bit there, and um, I, I, you know I, on the first say I kind of took my eye off the ball. Um, so, but you know how different would it have been? Who knows? Matt, John, as much as you can, would you talk about your exit? Were you looking for it at that time, or did they come to you and? How were you paid up front versus earnout, and what was your ongoing commitment to the to the company? So um, most of the, most of the terms of the deal are, are quiet, but I can speak to some of them. Um, I knew the the CEOs of all my strategic you know potential strategic acquirers very well. I mean, we sat on a on a board together. Um, I knew these guys, and you know I had thought about the idea of selling and it actually came from almost a, a, a funny email I had sent sent them and and uh, you know go you know we were on different sides of something and I said well if you buy me for enough money I'll vote with you and <laughs> um, and actually that started the discussions um, I, in an interesting twist and I wouldn't recommend this to everybody but I, I then contacted a um, an investment banker who understood the industry and he said, look, John, I'd love to help you, but you know these guys better than I do. And you're not missing anything in terms of who your strategic guys are. Um, you know, if you get into the middle of it and think you're over your head, let me know. But I think you're fine going on your own. And um, so I actually ended up doing the acquisition without, um, without a, uh, an investment banker. Um, the um, I did not. Uh, I have obviously some non-competes and such, um, but uh, the confirmation from my bank uh, came at 9:30 in the morning. At 11:30, my stuff was packed and I was 
out looking for another office. Um, but they had a lot of expertise, and, and you know, most of my people you know, were staying around. And, and so when you're that big, you have to do things your way. So the idea, even though they kept coming and going, wow, you do this really well, and you do that really well, and that really well, at the end of the day, they, it, it, it didn't work that way. Right. They went and put in all of their things, and you know, some of them probably helped, and some of them didn't. And, and so they knew what they were going to do. Um, How about the psychology for you of giving up your baby at that point? Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately, in, in 1988, I, I sold the family Pepsi business, so I was a little used to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you, the idea of, of, of um, giving up, uh, you know, I spent 30 years building the brand, and most of the brand has been rolled into Deer Park. So, you know, yeah, I see my trucks once in a while, and that's okay, but, um, yeah, it, it, the, I... I'm sure there's even part of me that doesn't understand the impact it's, it's had on me. Because it was 30 years of, of my life, and that made it um, you know, difficult to give up. Um, but uh, you know, I enjoy the things I get to do now. And I was ready to go give back. And I was fortunate that I had seen other worlds through my involvement with Emphonic and stuff that made life a lot easier. Now you mentioned uh, your GM issue. On the other hand, it sounds like you were terrific at picking other employees, uh, having the right culture, keeping them motivated and engaged. What kinds of benefits did you offer to them to keep them engaged? What kinds of communication? How did you involve them in the continuous improvement of your business to maintain that phenomenal uh, revenue growth that you mentioned? So um, here's what I'll tell you. We, we probably paid market wages. Um, our senior staff, probably not even quite as high as my competitors. The, the, the guys that, that stayed around and went to work for, for my acquirer um, are making a lot more now than they were under me. Mm. Um, but there were several things that, that I did that, uh, one was keeping communication open, um, in that we had a, a weekly staff meeting of, the, of the, the, the sort of six, seven senior managers. And that went on every Tuesday regardless of what was going on. We had that, that was, and, and when I say every Tuesday, I'm talking about from 1984 on. We had that. I don't know, everybody I'm sure has seen the one minute manager. Um, I, I used that a lot as to how I, I made sure I was keeping regular communication. And it was, a, you know, a, a constant teaching process, a, a constant, uh, you know, sort of download of, of what I was thinking and what I was expecting and where I saw things going. And I kept that, um, kept that going constantly. So there weren't surprises. Nobody went, oh, I don't know if John's going to like this or is this going to fit into what we're doing. And, and, you know, inevitably I'd get two managers disagreeing on something. And I said, well, you know, how do we think about treating customers? And they'd say this. I said, so which way is the right way? And it became very clear and, and, and very obvious. Um, I would say that, you know, I didn't treat, I treated everybody with a lot of respect, but I always also kept the line between them being my, you know, personal friends. Because, you know, when the day came and some, you had to say, no, this is where we're going, that's a lot harder to do with your friends than somebody who you've treated with respect. And, um, you know, I, I consider them, you know, I consider myself to have been very close with them. Uh, but they're still not in that, that sort of, um, you know, inner circle. But so my top two, my plant manager and my operations manager ran all the routes. I would take them every year to the ACC basketball tournament. You know, and they thought the world of it. They were traveling with me. We're doing, and then we kind of hang out for those few days. Um, but the rest of the days, it's like, did they come to my house for dinner? No. Right. Um, so. What about getting their ideas? So continuous improvement, yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, always. And, and I made sure to, you know, um, you know try to, if, if their idea wasn't quite ready or, or it wasn't quite on, is um, ask the kind of questions that would get them to the point where I wanted it to go, but it still felt to them like it was their doing. And, and so everybody felt like they were part of, of what it was. 
And at the end of the day, when you're growing consistently, it's a lot easier to keep people happy. People like playing for a winner, yeah. and, and so that helps. But that they feel like they're a, a, a big part of that um, makes, makes a difference. And sometimes the roles are different. Um, my plant manager probably wasn't the guy who came up with the most innovations. But was he proud of the fact that every single day that he was my plant manager, we never had a day where we couldn't send out the trucks because we didn't have product ready. You know, that's a big deal. And he knew it's a big deal. Um, and, and that was also the case of looking, you know, some people, are, he had lots of street smarts. And that's what we needed out of that role. Um, I had looked at guys who had a lot more understanding of the manufacturing process and such, but it wasn't going to fit with what we were doing. So, um, and one of the unique things we did for our employees, by the way, because when you have a delivery staff, getting everybody there every day is really important, is we didn't have sick days. Hmm. We instead paid bonuses for um, uh, attendance. If you, were, if you didn't miss a day during the month, um, then you got a half day's pay of bonus. So at the end of the year, that's, that's six days, which... You know, so if you think if somebody doesn't take any sick days, you give them five sick days so they get paid for those five sick days. Well, these guys actually would make six. And if you went the whole year, you got a bonus day on top of that. So people who didn't miss a day made out really, really well. That's an interesting approach. I don't think I've ever heard. Well, I've heard, I've heard people, I've heard people disparage that notion in the news, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying, well, you know, really, you're going to send them my people for showing up. That's horrible. That's a great. That sounds like a great idea, though, right? Because you yeah. said instead of saying. Um, hey, you know, if you got a little sniffle, can you make oh, it? Oh yeah, no. And people showed up. People weren't late because, by the way, being more than being more than 15 minutes late counted as a half day. So, um, yeah. So people weren't. You know, our attendance was 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 very strong because of this. And at the end of the year, you know, they got these bonuses, and everybody's like, "Oh, this is my Christmas bonus." And and you know, here they've been showing up, and and they get all. And the other thing that we did with that is that we had this program called the STAR program where um, you got STARS for attendance and then you got STARS for doing something above and beyond your normal job. You know, you came up with a new way to do something or whatever and we did this at the manager's meeting every week, which, which was twofold. It was one, to recognize employees. It was two, to have our managers think about people doing things right. You know, we, we all catch everything that our people do wrong. <laughs> That's easy. But catching them doing something right is hard. And so this put that focus on catching people doing things right. So you get these stars. And at the holiday party, we'd convert them into play money where they, that they could use in an auction for real prizes. You know, television, some, some are small, some big. Um, you know, tickets to something, DVDs for, for those who didn't have as many stars. And this auction was like a, a big deal. So that was another incentive to get there every single day and to think about doing things right for the company. Because when you saw the guy who had all the stars and he got to take home a lot of stuff, you think, I, that's what I want to do next year. Well, so, uh, okay, quick, quick one, and then I want to let John wrap us up. So go ahead, Isabella. Um, you mentioned you were part of several uh, networking groups and mm -hmm. branched out into different products. You were on the board of many groups. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, it, the funny thing in the bottled water business is, is that the numbers are, because you're dealing with all these small customers, the numbers are, are, are significantly different for, for new customers coming in. I don't know that I ever had a day that I didn't get a new customer. But one wasn't going to work because even though our, our loss rate of customers was fairly low, um, you know, if you think of 14% of, of our customers we're going to lose in a year, well, you know, even when we, only, even when we were at, 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 um, at 10,000 customers, that's 1,400 customers in a year that we're going to lose. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, four a day that we're losing. So we better be getting a lot in. Um, I think that I always tried to think of our company as being big, always. I never thought of us as just small because I knew where I wanted to get to. Um, we just weren't, you know, at that size yet. It meant I had to do more of the things myself. But I think somewhere in the um, in the mid '80s, uh, '85, '86, all of a sudden it's like not to 
for a pun, but it's like somebody turned on the spigot. And in the summer, we would be answering the phone and signing up 20, 30 new customers a day. And, and you know, so that, that was when you went, wow, this, this business is really going somewhere. Um, and that was when it became obvious that it was time to get out of the Pepsi business. Hmm. So, John, how about, you, uh, how about you wrap us up? What are some last thoughts you want to share with everybody here in the two, two or three minutes we have left? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because I feel like I learned more now than, than I did before in, in, in several different ways because I see a lot of, a lot of businesses. Um, uh, but the things to think about is how you get from where you are to just a half step away. And particularly that's critical as you're starting. But it's also where do you want to get to? Where do you want to be five years from now? What do you want to be doing? What do you want your company to be doing? I mean, without that, it, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's like setting out on a, on a journey without knowing what the destination is. And some businesses do well anyway. But the fact is, is that if you know where you're going and can manage to that, it's going to be a lot easier. And the other thing is, is that most of us know or at least can feel what's right and what's not right. But sometimes it's a very hard road, that, that one that's, that's the right way to go or it's going to slow growth for a little while or, or whatever. Stick, stick to what you think is right um, because it'll serve you well in the long run. Uh, and, and just stay with what you know, know is right. Don't take the easy path because it, it isn't going to lead to long-term success. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Appreciate it. It's awesome. Sure.